He is more than able. Yes, yes. He Trouble in my way, trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes, I have to cry sometimes. There's so much trouble, trouble in my way. I have to cry sometimes, I have to cry sometimes. When I lay awake at night, y'all lay awake at night. I lay awake at night, y'all lay awake at night. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, we're coming to the love 
church say amen. Amen. Lord God has been true and good to you. Let me hear you say amen. 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 Now it's time for our scripture reading. I will be reading from Luke, the 15th chapter, starting at the 11th verse, concluding at the 14th verse. And the Bible reads, and he said, a certain man had two sons. Mm -hmm. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of good that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a false country. And there wasted his substance with rowdyous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty thing in that land. And he began to be in want. May God have a blessing on his word yes. for the hearers yes. and doers. Yes. Amen. Amen. Without you, Lord. Without you, Lord. Without you, Lord, without you, Lord. 
Parker, he retired anyway. Yeah. I've been doing a long time. Yeah. Parker, I'm going to buy a couple places here in town. And I want you to come on down and just stay there rent free. <laughs> come on. Just, just come on. Just let me know. Come on, come on, Parker. It's good to see you this morning. Uh, God is truly, truly blessing us. We, we just, uh, I tell you, it, it's, it's just a serenity of God. That allow us to to just bask in His tranquility, and I mean we just we just overjoyed this morning. He's, he's truly have done much for us that we definitely could not have done for ourselves. And to see what God is doing, uh, it give you a reason to say Amen. It give you a reason, to say, Lord, I sure do thank you for being so good to us. Now, I don't know about you last night, but uh, a lot a lot of us rested well, and God woke us up this morning, of course, and and we're here. And we are forever grateful this morning. And uh, like I've said before, your name came up last night. Your name came up in a conversation last night. And look like, look like the, the angel of life was shouting over your name. And you're here this morning. We want to tell the Lord thank you. We're just, this morning we are looking forward to this gospel meeting this week. Uh, our speaker here, Dr. Flowers, uh, he's world known. Dr. Flowers is a husband, a father, a minister, educator. Uh, he's an author, a radio host, a community advocate. Uh, he's a senior minister at the Great Road Church of Christ in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, he serves as the executive director of diversity and belonging. He serves as a faculty member in the upper school, sociology, uh, and culture. I tell you, there's so much here going on. I'm just going to say, I'm just glad we're here. I'm just glad he's here. And, and all this education he got, I, I was going to use it ain't and that and but. So I'm going to have to dig deep and come up with some stuff. He holds five academic degrees. Obtaining his doctorate at age 27. He's married to the love of his life, Tamika, and has two amazing sons, Jeremy Jr. and Joshua. And I tell you, I, I had an opportunity on uh, last year to... Uh, to attend the conference, the Joshua Conference, uh, there in Cincinnati, and I tell you, I had a, I had a wonderful time, and it was it was a, a conference that was very intimate in ministry, and I, I walked away with a better love for Christ, and I thank God for that conference. It was it was a a great conference, and I look forward to attending again on this year. So I'm going to get out of your way. I don't know which song leader is coming. Uh, I don't know, but whoever it is, y'all just keep doing what you've been doing because it's been absolutely good. I want you to know if you are visiting with us this morning, we are so glad, so, so glad to have you and, and to look up and to see the Williams family walk in. Bro, Will, it did me good, too. It did me good. So it's just good to see you all this morning. We have other visitors here. We're so glad to see you, and we pray that something in this lesson will encourage those who are not members of the Church of Christ to lay down their part and pick up the part and allow Christ to be the head of their life. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, of course, a couple of quick announcements. I won't be able to do them later. I want to remind you there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer, uh, 18, no, no, 2555. 2555. You're within that range of 25 to 55. We ask that you sign up on that list. We are working uh, to prepare a uh, a group, a group to uh, to kind of spend time. We were trying to trying to develop this group. And if you're between the ages of 25 and 55, we want you to please sign up. Please sign up. It's going to be very important. And uh, then we're working on another 18 to 24, ages 18 to 24. So we got some things to, to do. And I tell you, God is really working closely. If you look around this morning, we almost got a full house. And that is truly a blessing this morning. Truly a blessing. At this time, before, uh, we're just going to ask that you pray uh, for Brother Flowers on this morning. And uh, we just, Brother Flowers, you, it's, it's 15 to 12. We yet no hurry. And we say, we mean that, don't we, church? We yet no hurry. So you, you do what you do. And uh, we got the food is being warmed up so it can stay warm. We good. We good. We, we look forward to this time of year. So at this time, uh, which song leader going to? All right. Y'all give him a hand as he come. Come on, come on, Parker. Come on, Parker. 
been in your city all weekend. I got me a new son-in-law. Daughter got married on yesterday. Praise God. And I'm gonna leave him right down here with y'all. I last, uh, when I last stood before you, I asked you all to pray for me because I was dealing with some, some health issues with my kidneys, and, and I am now on dialysis. But God is still good. So you keep right on praying for me because I go on June the 6th to get my name on the list so I can give me a new kidney. And I have already claimed my kidney. I don't know about the rest of the folks in there on them getting their kidney. But I already claimed my kidney and I already told the Lord, thank you for that kidney. So I'm in a thankful mood this morning. So y'all help me. Thank you, Lord. I just want to, I want to thank you. Sing it like you, you mean it. Lord. Oh, Lord, I want to thank you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord. I just want to I'm thinking thank all by myself if I have to. Sister Miller, I'm thanking you. Help me now. Oh, thank you, Lord. Now, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, you know, oh Lord, I want to thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, thank you, Lord. Well, Help me, somebody. Well, I just want to thank you, Lord. You've been so good. You've been so good. You've been so good. You've been. So good. You've been been so, been so good, so good. good. Oh, oh, yes, you have you been, been, been so, been, been, been so good. Lord, you, Lord, you, Lord, you been, been so good, Lord, you so, been so good. So good. Oh, Lord, Lord, and I just want to. <laughs> Thank you, you, Lord. You've been, Lord. Friend, you've been my friend. You've been my friend. You've been my friend. You've been, been my, my, my best my friend. Oh, Lord, Lord you've been, been my, been my, been my friend. Lord, Lord, Lord you've you been, 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 you been my, been my you've been Lord. My friend, and I just want to thank you, Lord. You brought me out, you brought me out, you brought me out. Brought me, brought me out. Oh, Lord, you brought, brought me, brought me out. So good, you've been so good, been so good, you've been so good, you've been so good, been so good, so good. Help me, somebody. Oh, Lord, you've been so good, been so good, been so good. Lord, you've been, you've been so good, you've been so good. Yes, you have. I just want to thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, I want to thank you. 
you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you. Oh, help me now. I just want to thank you. Every chance I get, I just want to thank you. When I'm down on my knees, I just want to thank you. When problems rise up, I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you, Lord. Praise God. Let all of those who love the Lord say amen. amen. Let all of those who love the Lord say amen again. Amen. Let all of those called according to his purpose have been beneficiaries of the unspeakable, unfathomable, unconscionable, and unconditional love of God say amen one more time. Amen. I invite you to put your hands together for the man of God, Brother Jeff Miller and his first lady. Uh, to the bishops, the leadership, and the membership of this great church, I send my greetings. Uh, to be in any place is a blessing, but to be in this place, the historic Atlanta Street Church, is most definitely an honor. I count the opportunity to stand in this place and share my common faith in Jesus Christ to be a joy. Good to see Brother Lomax again as well. It's been almost 20 years uh, when we were in Forney, Texas together and see him still serving the Lord. This church has done amen to that, amen to that. Uh, much has been done for my arrival, and I'm so thankful that this church has shown the utmost hospitality and done everything possible to make me feel at home down in Texarkana. Now, this is an interesting setup because I know we eat after this, but I can actually see the kitchen. Say amen. You know, you know usually it's somewhere else. You can't see it. But now I'm intimidated because the kitchen is right there. So we can see the food. We can smell the food. So I already know uh, that I am on borrowed time. Uh, I know that. I know that. So meet me, if you would, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 15, the Gospel of Luke. Chapter number 15, we pray to bring something fruitful from the familiar. Luke chapter 15, verse number 11, when you find yourself there, let's be standing for the reading of God's holy, inerrant, and infallible word. Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse number 11, we'll be reading this morning and the rest of the week from the New International Version. Luke chapter 15, verse number 11, and can I beg one favor and get more volume on this microphone? Say amen. Luke chapter 15, Verse number 11. I got five sermons to preach, and I need voice to preach them all. Uh, Luke chapter 15, beginning there at verse number 11. There, Jesus declares the following. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country. And there squandered his wealth in wild and or riotous living. After he had spent everything that he had, there was a severe famine in that whole country. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, oh, you ought to be shouting over that right there. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. 
I will set out and I will go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went off to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven, and I've sinned against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, Quick, bring him the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and let us celebrate. If you have some time this morning as the Holy Spirit of God shall lead me, I want to speak from the thought, unspeakable love. Unspeakable love. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Let us go to God in prayer. Devilly kind and gracious Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for what was, what is, and what will be as long as we continue to stay faithful. Father God, be with everyone under the sound of my voice. Father, open our minds, our hearts, our spirits, our souls, and yes, even our ears to hear a word coming straight from you via your manservant. Father, your manservant himself is a sinner. Father, sometimes I'm fickle. Sometimes I'm faulty. Sometimes I'm fake, Father. But I ask right now that you forgive me my own sin. And upon my repentant and heart, Father, speak to me and speak through me. Father, please unleash your spirit in this place. Let it rest, rule, and ruminate wherever you decided to go. Father God, please do not let your word return void. Get yourself all the honor, all the glory, all the praise, because you deserve it. Father, bless the word. Father, bless your servant. Father, bless us all as your children. All these things we ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endureth forever. Unspeakable love. As we navigate the Luke 15 narrative, before we see love as God's purpose, we must first use his lenses to see the people of his audience. Notice as Jesus is now en route from the Pharisee's house to Jerusalem, here he speaks to this crowd that is cosmopolitan in nature, constituted of both sinners and saints, tax collectors and Pharisees that quite frankly look a little bit like you and me. This crowd as a cosmopolitan cornucopia was composed of different backgrounds, different cultures, different demographics, different postures, positions, and proclivities. And it was Jesus' teaching that was powerful, provocative, and attractive because it touched people how they lived and where they lived. So even in this instance where thousands of people are hearing, everyone is still listening. For Jesus is speaking to everyone. And if you listen closely even on this morning, then Jesus will even speak a word to you. In tracing Luke chapter number 15, Jesus, knowing his audience, communicates the first parable about the lost sheep as it would historically and contextually touch the hearts of the men and the boys in the crowd. Then it would be the women and the girls of this audience that would appreciate the story about the coin that was lost from the wedding necklace. And then Jesus, in seeking to reach the very heart of the sinner, thus touching men, women, boys, and girls all at the same time, then he here communicates, illustrates, and animates a story of a lost, wayward, and or prodigal son. Jesus says, now that I have your attention, I want to tell you a story not about waywardness or carelessness, but rather about repentance. But Jesus says, I'm going to tell you parabolically a story as your brother about our father. Superficially, this parable will cover a lost son. 
But in actuality, it covers both sons and daughters. In superfluity, it will cover an abundance of outward wealth. But in actuality, the wealth that our Father gives us is, in fact, within. Meaning that when it comes to my Father's wealth, while you can't spend it, it can, in fact, save you. I don't have to tell a church as astute as Atlanta Street, but a parable simply defined is a heavenly meaning wrapped within an earthly example. A heavenly meaning wrapped within an earthly example. Jesus in parables purports that though you see it now, you will not grasp it now. But church, unlike this audience of antiquity, if today we choose to listen to God and lean on God and learn from God, then we can grasp Jesus' truth from this text. And that truth is that we all have a father who's both loving and forgiving. We all have a father who's both loving and forgiving. And he loves us so much that he has prepared both our course and our recourse. Church, God's love planned our return even before our exit. He planned our return even before our exit. This parable is a typically and colloquially known as the parable of the prodigal son. The word prodigal means wasteful. And while some in this text see the sun, let me tell you something, Texarkana, one cannot look at this text and miss the father. For it's this parabolical father who is both our parenthetical and pragmatic father. Meaning this father, and I'm talking about God himself, is not just my father on paper, but he's also my father in pain. He's not just my father on paper, but he's my father in problems, in proclivity, in reality, in hurt, in habit, and hang up. Is anybody else glad to have a father like this? It's this father that loved us even before we knew what love was. And let me tell you something. His love is so surreal. His love is so surreal in that he shows me love that doesn't even have to be spoken. Hence, unspeakable love. God's love is so surreal that it says, I love you faithfully even when you treat me foolishly. His love is so surreal that he loves me in the pig pen because he knows that I belong in the palace. His love is so surreal that he doesn't ask me questions, but he hopes that eventually I figure out that he is the answer. His love is so surreal that when I come back to him, he puts me in the same position I was in when I left, if not even better. His love is so surreal that he entrusts me continually with his riches even when I keep wasting his investment. His love is so surreal that even when others say my father ought to be ashamed of me, he keeps showing me love that I don't understand. His love is so surreal that he heals me even the presence of my haters so that while you may want to superficially categorize this as the parable of the prodigal son, I, after living with God, I, after learning from God, I, I, after leaning on God and I after trying my best to love God have to see this as the parable of a loving father I came all the way from Cincinnati Ohio on a plane that was supposed to go to Texarkana it was supposed to switch in Dallas when we got to Dallas it was storming as most of y'all already know they delayed my plane and then delayed my plane, then canceled my flight. Got in a rental car, drove three hours from Dallas to Texarkana. Had everything but my luggage. Had to wake up this morning, go to the smallest airport I ever seen in my life and go retrieve my luggage. And I did all of that to tell somebody in Texarkana that we have a father who's both loving and forgiving. Notice as Jesus speaks these parables in Luke chapter 15 that he's very delicate as he speaks in triplicate. If you go through this monologue in reverse order, Jesus proves that our father cares about the 50% in terms of one son over another. He proves he cares about the 10%, the one coin of the wedding necklace. 
Then he proves he cares about the 1% because he leaves for the one lost sheep. I know you can't shout to that. That's because you ain't never been to 1%. Have you ever been to 1% of people where Jesus had to leave everybody else and go find you? Have you ever been the one everybody talks about at church because you were the one who was wayward? You were the one who didn't live right? You were the one who was rebellious? Is there anybody else who's ever been that one percent? Who's ever been that lost sheep? Who's ever, well, is there anybody who's ever benefited from the prayers of grandma and grandpa because folk were worried about you? Anybody ever had to be chastised by God? Can I take a commercial break right here? I know you know about Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leaves me beside still waters. Right? But the next verse says, he maketh me lie down where? In green pastures. He's speaking of sheep. He's speaking of that lost sheep. Back it up, Dr. Flowers. He maketh me lie down. Where? In green pastures. That's because shepherds, after a while of going to get rebellious sheep time and time again, what they do is they gently break the leg of the sheep to make them lie down. Lie down where? In green pastures. The problem is we don't know what's good for us. Therefore, once we keep doing our own thing, God will eventually bring us back, break our legs, and make us lie down in green pastures because we're too busy trying to find brown grass. I wish I had somebody in here. Is there anybody who's ever been the one percent, the, the one lost sheep? This text tells us that God cares about the 50 percent. He cares about the 10 percent, and he cares about the one percent. You got time for this? Verse number one. We're going to verse number 11, but verse number one. In Luke chapter 15, verse number one. There the text says, now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to what? Hear Jesus. Here we see sinners wanting to hear the word of God. But it's those who are self-righteous. Those who feel they've already arrived. They didn't come to hear Jesus. They came to hassle Jesus. Can I tell you something? The biggest sin in the church ain't smoking. It ain't drinking. It ain't fornicating. The biggest sin in the church is self-righteousness. Verse number two. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered and said, there you go, this man welcomes sinners. This man Man by composition, but Messiah by constitution. This man, man by thought, but God by theology. This man does what? He welcomes sinners. Now the common term for sinners in the Greek is hamartia, which means to miss the mark. But the word here is hamartolos. It means those who are devoted to sin. It means those who are preeminently sinful. It means those who are especially wicked. I don't know about you, Texarkana, but I'm so glad that God sits with sinners. I'm so glad that he messes with the messed up. I'm so glad he gives witness to the wicked because that means he can deal with me, all of me. Is there anybody in here who's willing to say that I don't just sin by garden variety? I've sinned with great specificity specificity and even intentionality i know we love to quote romans 3 23 for all has sinned and fall short of the honor and glory of god as if we did an accident or we made a mistake but is there anybody who's real on this morning who can say yes i sinned and sometimes i did it on purpose sometimes i made a reservation sometimes i called ahead sometimes i said meet me at the spot you know what's gonna happen there are some people who are hamotolas are especially wicked are especially sinful and I'm so glad that Jesus came to deal with me he came to welcome me he came to eat with me I wish I had somebody in here he can deal he can deal with me all of me because we all have a me that nobody else sees if you knew all of me y'all would have sent me a plane ticket to come here you know the me I allow you to see but the Miller read a biography of the me I want you to see. You heard a husband and activist and minister. And everybody said, ooh, but if you knew me, all of me, would you disqualify me? But there is a God who welcomes sinners, who welcomes the wicked, who welcomes the toe up from the flow up. He welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Notice 
in this text, Jesus is speaking to the audacity of his contextual audience. And the irony that you can't handle lost people and sinners when in fact you are lost people and sinners. Yes, you serve in the church. Yes, you put on a shirt and tie. Yes, you know all three verses to match and robe and crown. Yes, you know the books of the Bible. But we are all still lost people and sinners. And church, it's when we engage in sin that we all go away lost and into a faraway place. And the same way you want me to accept you when you stray ought to be the same way that you fix your mind and attitude to welcome others when they stray. We ought to rejoice when sinners are brought to repentance if from no other perspective than from a personal perspective. The same way I was glad when God tamed my lying tongue is the same way I'm glad for you when he curves your cussing tongue. The same way I was happy when he fixed my broken self-esteem is the same way I ought to be happy when he fixes your broken church attendance. The same way I was happy when he brought my marriage back from the brink of divorce is the same way I ought to be happy for you when he brings your child home from jail. So church, if Christ himself welcomed and ate with sinners, then why are we as Christians who are extensions of Christ himself so afraid of sinners when we just like them sin. Church, we have a confusing and chaotic complex when we are afraid of who we were, especially when every now and then who we were is who we are. So verse 3 says, Then Jesus told them this parable. Without responding to the Pharisees straightforwardly, he responds to them through story. And he commences to teach and tell us three parables. But it's the third textual teaching that will focus on regards to the theology of the prodigal son. Verse number 11, the Bible says, Jesus continued. Jesus continued and said, there was a man who had two sons. Now, Luke, being a powerful and pragmatic physician, brings forth four things in this text, four things. One thing about me is you don't have to ever think about when I'm done preaching. You'll know because I go verse to verse and word to word. Say amen. It's very easy to follow. I can't hop over here and over there and get this, get that. I, I, I can't do all that. I, I, you know, nothing wrong with that. I just can't do that. So if you ever want to know when Dr. Flowers is done just follow the text Jesus continued and said there were two sons four things for my note takers four things this text illustrates number one it gives us sins sickness number two it gives us sins symptoms number three it gives us sins cycle and number four it gives us sins solution sins sickness occurs whenever independence is desired from the father the Father's house, the Father's word, the Father's will, and the Father's way. Sin's symptoms include depression, desperation, demanding, and desertion. Right here in the text. Sin's cycle revolves around hurt, pain, and false dependency. But if I get time, sin's solution is to always go back to a loving Father. There was a man who had two sons. To get ahead of myself, these sons represent the Jews and the Gentiles. These sons represent some people right here in Atlanta Street, the self-righteous and the sinner. But I'm so glad that both these sons have the same father. I'm so glad that both these sons have the same father. Verse 12 says, the younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Give me, notice he demands, give me my share of the estate. <laughs> the firstborn contextually will receive a double share of the inheritance. This young man is robbing himself out of his future. He wants his father's wealth now. How many of us want things from our father that we can't hold or handle? God, give it to me now. 
Now, we know from American stance of inheritance that normally you bequeath an inheritance when you die, but in this time you could bequeath an inheritance even when you were alive. But the thing was, though the father could give it to you, you were not allowed to sell it. And you would only get one third of his wealth. And here's where scripture diverges from culture because in this culture, once you wasted what you inherited, it was gone. But I'm so glad that I serve a God who won't let me lose, who won't let me fail, who won't let me falter, who gives me even when I mess up what I got. But this young man said, give me my share, my part, my lot, my destiny. Give me my destiny now. And it's dangerous, Atlanta Street, to give someone their destiny who has not yet been to destinations. But this boy, like us, especially in our youth, he wants his later now. And when we want our later now, we often can't handle the now and drag our now into our later. Give me my share of the estate now. So the father, what? Divides his property between them. Divides in the Greek is tore off. And as soon as he tore off to his younger son, his younger son who couldn't handle it, he tore away from his father. If I had time for commercial break, I would tell you a lot of times we fall into sin, biting off more than we can chew. And taking hold of something that we can't handle. Patience is the devil's tool to plunder. But the father divides his property between who? Them. Both got the blessing. One stayed in the house. So now we see that this younger boy got a third of the wealth. The older boy got two thirds of the wealth. And understand that the text says that both of them can have salvation if they would both just turn to the father. Though one brother went to the country and one stayed in the house, don't miss this, both brothers were sinners. Both were lost. You can be lost even in the house. One was supposedly a hedonist. One was a moralist. Both are sinful. Because I know somebody here today is saying, well, you know, that's just what they do. They leave the church. They go to college. They don't live right. I've been here the whole time. I've been at Atlanta Street. I don't know where you've been. You've been out nowhere. You ought to be here. You ought to be more like me. You ought to be more like your sister. You ought to be more like your brother. You ought to be more like your cousin. You ain't nobody. To the older brother, the self-righteous member, I know you man, but guess what? God loves us too. He knows we got problems. He knows we have proclivities and addictions, but he loves us too. He lifts up even those who screwed up. For the older brother in the audience, stay faithful and stay humble because your father got something for you too. But is anybody like Dr. Flowers this morning who's the younger brother? Anybody like me who's taking the father's love for granted? I want to tell you before I take my seat that God still has a place. God still has a purpose. And God still has a promise for us. And it's in the father's house. The father is wanting, the father is willing, and the father is waiting for someone in this audience to both come to their senses and come to their savior. Mm. This father gave away all that he had, but notice he was still wealthy. That's how I know that the father of this text speaks directly to God. God gave it all away. And he still has more than enough. And it's since God always has more than enough that he can give us back even that which we have lost. Because the God we serve is a God of true restoration. The younger son went on his way. 
in verse 13, not long after that, because our Father only lets us have what we have when we can handle what we have. He could not handle what he had. See, that's how we get in trouble. We think we grown. We think we big. We think we bad. We get too big for our britches. Say amen when you can. The younger son got together all that he had and set off for a distant country. Sanago is the Greek term there. He got together all that he had to convert for easy use. Remember, you can inherit early, but you could not sell your inheritance. And what does this young man do? He sells his inheritance. But he can't go down to the ATM and get money. But rather he has to barter and trade to convert for easy use. Okay. He had to go to the pawn shop. And I know none of y'all ever been to a pawn shop. But if you ever been to the pawn shop, you never get the true value for what you're trading in. This young man sold his father's inheritance for less than it was worth. And whenever you give up what God has put in you, you give it up for less than it's really worth. But this young man, he goes off where? To the far country. Understand, far country is not just geographical, but rather the far country is a place that exists in all of our hearts. Meaning what? You can serve right here and still be far away from God. You can serve the table. You can serve the food. You can teach Bible class. You can sing with the Asley brothers and praise and worship. And still, I was waiting for the choreography. It's nights like this. They want it. All right, no, no, no. And you can still be in a faraway country. Your license may say Arkansas or Texas, but you can still be a resident of the far country. Stop acting like just because you're the older brother that you're the better brother. The Bible says he went there and squandered his wealth in wild or riotous living. Squandered in the Greek means to scatter abroad and to throw wheat into air. I throw grain into the air and try to separate the chaff. That's what he did with his father's wealth. He cared nothing of it. To make it more modern, he made it rain. With his father's wealth. And participated where? In wild and riotous living. Well, what was he doing? Everything you be doing. Huh? You know, and the older brother would say later on in the same chapter where well, he was out there with prostitutes and with wild women. How would you know? See, there's some sins you only know if you. Can I have some story time? Uh, see, uh, while I was born and raised in Detroit and I live in Cincinnati now, I had some time in the South. I, I went to Southwestern Christian College. Uh, my first uh, pastoral assignment was Memphis, Tennessee. When I got married to my wife, we took up home and residence in the state of Mississippi, in Tunica, Mississippi. Tunica, Mississippi. Tunica, Mississippi. Some of you already know all about Tunica, Mississippi. In Tunica, Mississippi, there are nine casinos. Say amen when you can. And because we were young and poor, I said young and poor, uh, our first address was 1632 Harris Casino Parkway. That's where we could afford to live. Now, when we lived in Tunica, Mississippi, you didn't have a grocery store down the street. Either you had to go 20 miles north to Walmart or 20 miles south to the Piggly Wiggly. Yes, I said the Piggly Wiggly. And, 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 and you know, you know, being broke and young and, you know, I could go down to Piggly Wiggly and go buy eggs and bacon and oh, I could go right there to Harris Casino because they do this thing at the, you never been there, but they, they do this thing at the casino uh, where, where, you know, if you spend a little bit of money on the slots 
they will comp your meal. Ever heard? It's a foreign concept, I know. But, but you know, you could get breakfast for 39 cents. It, it was amazing. $3 at the slot. Okay. 39 cent breakfast. I was going for the economic benefit. And church folks said, why are you going there? We saw you at the casino. And I said, well, hold on, wait a minute. They don't even have windows. So you can't be outside and see me on the... We both there. Can I drop this on you real quick? People always ask me questions by the mail away. Is this a sin? Is that a sin? Can I get a tattoo? Is that a sin? Can I get earrings? Sin is not about motion. It's about motivation. It's not just the what. It's the why. You at the casino getting breakfast. Where else can you find crab legs for nine ninety nine? He was out there with women and prostitutes. How do you know? Well, I just know he had wild and riotous living. What is that? Whatever you do, put your sin in the blank. Because you got it too. And don't look at me just because you're older as if you don't have sin. Long before you started carrying peppermints and butterscotch in your purse. It don't make no sense. These babies got these cell phones texting all kind of nasty stuff. But you used to write a letter and seal it with a kiss. What they texting what you were writing? Huh? Am I in the house? All this music, all this mumble rap, all this nasty stuff, all this Meg the Stallion. Who's making love to your old lady? Turn off the lights. Wild and riotous living. But check this out. Verse 14. After he spent all that he had. Because sin will take everything you have. And make you forget the father who gave it to you. Sin promises freedom. But only brings slavery. It promises success. But only brings failure. It promises life. But the wages of sin is still death. Can I say it like I want to say it? Sin will trick you and then pimp you. There was a severe famine, an insatiable hunger. Why? Because when you refuse the bread of life, you'll always be hungry. And that whole country is under famine. Why? Because notice first he went broke. Then the place where he took shelter broke down around him. Sin will always take you to a place where it will have you, destroy you, and then self-destruct around you. So even the place where you took refuge will retreat on you. Sin does self-deflate after a while. For once sin breaks you, it breaks down around you. And that which you have confidence in will in fact cave in. So he began, this young man, to be in need. Because sin will let you live for a little while. After a little while, you'll figure out that sin only lasts for a short while. This far country was not what he expected. His resources ran out. His friends left him and a famine came. And this boy was forced to do for a stranger that which he would not do for his own father. And that's work. So verse 15, he went and joined himself or hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Wait a minute. At what point did he not think or consider of just going back 
where he was. All this heartache, all this trouble, all this turmoil. And he said, you know what? I'm going to stay right where I am. Is there anybody who can relate? Where you were deep in sin, deep in struggle, deep in drama, and you thought like Jeremy has thought sometimes, well, I can keep making it better. I'll just keep doing wrong because eventually wrong will turn to right. Anybody ever dug yourself in a hole and you kept digging to find your way out by going down? It sounds foolish, but that's how we do. Well, you know, I know this ain't right, but we, just one more time. Just two more weeks. This the last time. But the last time is never the last time. He went out and hired himself. Two Greek terms are here. Number one is to cleave and cement or glue himself. The same term we see in Genesis 2, right? For this call shall manly father and mother do what? Cleave unto his wife. He glues himself to a citizen of what? That country. The same place that's breaking down around him. He says, you know what? I'm going to chill out right here. And he hired himself, meaning what? The man didn't come find him for a job. He begged the man for a job. And the man said, no, ain't no work here. Well, please give me something. Ain't no work here. Please give me something. It ain't no work here. There's nothing for you to do. And that's exactly what church folk do. We know full well some of the stuff we got into, we had no business being there. Some of the places we went to was not set for Christians, and we made ourselves fit in places we had no business being in. You had no business at the club, but you made yourself there. You had no business in that man's bed, but you made yourself there. You had no business at the bar, but you made yourself there. And you cleave yourself and put yourself in places where you had no business. We got saints going to sinners for opportunities. And when saints go to sinners for opportunities, sinners will have saints doing things that even sinners don't do. Because the saints are begging the sinners to be like them. Let me fit in. Let me hook up. Let me join in. Ain't you God's child? Yeah, on weekends. And we live, starting with me, a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde existence. Please let me fit in. Please let me go with you. Please let me rock with y'all. And saints are begging sinners to be sinners. Then sinners have saints doing things that sinners don't do. He sent him out to feed pigs. A Gentile has a Jewish boy feeding swine. And even that doesn't last. Can I tell you something? I got to close soon. But if you keep in sin, you'll keep lowering your standards. I know I'm talking to somebody. You lower your standards. And you say, I, I never do that. But now you're doing it. Huh? Okay, I'm the only one in here. Okay. You ever set a boundary? I'm cool, long as we don't do this. Okay, new boundary. I'm cool, long as we don't do that. And now we're doing this and that. Feeding pigs. Verse 16. I'm going to stay on the floor so I can finish. Verse 16. Now he longed to fill his stomach with the pods, carob pods, that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. I'm hungry. I figured the sinners would give me what I'm looking for. All because I won't go back to my father. Only the father can give you what you really need. But even the sinners got me hungry. The pigs are eating better than me. All I want is some karab pods. Karab pods are gelatinous in nature. A lot of substance with no sustenance. So even if I ate them, I still wouldn't be full. Let me make that more. Mo, um, um, um. Okay, um, I'm in the Arkla text, right? Okay, let me make this more. Anybody like crawfish? Crawdads? Mud bugs? Now, y'all tell me why I can get me some of them because I live in Ohio, so, so I, I need something before I leave. But I love me some, some mud bugs. Suck the head, pinch the tail. Am I in the right place? All right. All right. All right. Huh. Don't let this education fool you. Now, 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 now. Mud bugs. And you can get five pounds of mud bugs and still be hungry. 
You done suck the head, pinch the tail. Got a whole lot of carcasses. A lot of substance. But not love sust. Okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. Anybody like pig feet? Huh. I mean pig feet. That brother don't like pig feet. Anybody else like pig feet? I know y'all call it slave food. Well, that's all right, master. I like pig feet. Uh, uh, barbecue pig feet? You can suck pig feet all day and steal. The boy is longing to eat the pods that the pigs are eating. But no one gave him anything. Because once Satan tricks you and pimps you, he robs you. And when he's done with you, he's done with you. He's done with you. And I know what it feels like to be washed up because Satan got all that he needed and he's through. And the sin that we do, and it's interesting, when we sin, it's like we got to have it right now. We can't live without it. Anybody ever had that feeling? You got to do it, got to do it, got to do it, got to do it, got to do it. Then you do it, it's like, that's it? Am I being real enough for you? Sin ever left you with an empty feeling? Still hungry? Needing more? And now you're in debt. Because working for Satan is like working up a credit card. Huh? The problem with a credit card ain't the principal, it's the interest. Well, I go to church every Sunday. You paying the minimum payment. You'll never get out of debt. Verse 17. I got to get these folks to lunch. Verse 17. In verse 17, the text continues. It says, when he came to his senses, praise God for good sense. Praise God for common sense. No matter how old you are, how long you've been doing it, who you've been doing it with, what you've been doing, thank God for common sense. I'm going to say this today. I'm going to say it a few more times before I leave here. God can save anyone from anything at any time. Nobody in here is too dirty to be cleaned up. And it's time for somebody under the sound of my voice to come to your senses. So hold on, wait. How many of my fathers, what? Hired servants. Have food to spare, and here I am starving to death. Hired servants. I'm his child, but his hired servants ain't hungry. I'm his child, but I'm out of my place. In verse 18, he says, look here. My father's servants got food to spare. Here I am starving to death. I will set out. I, personal, set out urgency. Go back to my father. And notice he starts practicing in the pig pen what he going to say. All right, look here. When I go back up in there, I know he going to be mad. I know he going to be tripping. I got a 13-year-old. See, I know he plans it out. And daddy going to be tripping. So this is what I'm going to say to curry his favor. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. All right, I got it. Got it. We, we know what we going to say. All right, so verse number 19, he starts going back to his father's house. Now am I going to say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm going to say, I'm no longer worthy. Better said, I'm no longer valuable to be called your son. Don't miss these next two words. Make me like one of your what? Make me. But before he left the house, he said, give me. Can I be at home? Give me my share. Now he's like, you know what? Make me. Because the journey of life humbles us in such a way to where you go from give me to make me. Is there anybody who's been humbled under life to where you came? You, you had to run back to your daddy and say, Father, I'm sorry. Is there anybody who's ever to run back to this church and say, Church, it's better here than it ever's been in the world. Make me like one of your, what? Hired servants. I left here a child, but I'll be happy to come back as a servant. I don't deserve nothing. Give me whatever you got. Anyway, you bless me, Lord. I'll be satisfied. 
So verse number 20, he gets off his, gets off his do nothing and he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion for him. Then what? Ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Can I work that real quick? The boy says, I've had enough. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I know what I'm going to say. I've already practiced my apology. Let me start walking to my father's house. But it wasn't about the son now. It's all about the father. When the father saw that he was still a long way off, he got up. He was filled with compassion. He ran. He threw his arms around him. He kissed him. What's going on here, Jeremy? Well, the father says, my son is now ready to come home. But he ain't said nothing yet. I don't look for the movement of the mouth. I listen to the movement of the heart. His heart shifted in that pig pen. And if you live long enough, God will bring you to a point in your life where your heart will shift. It might shift in the middle of your sin to where you say, I can't do this no more. I'm sorry. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I ain't going to do this no more. And God saw your heart shift. And while you were coming slowly, he decided to come quickly. Why? Because old men of oriental status normally didn't run. Why did the daddy run to the son, Jeremy? Well, there's a few reasons, but here's a good one. See, what happens is the community now sees this young man coming back. The same man they saw leave. And the father is running. Not just for the benefit of the son. But because of church folk. Because the community knew that sons who disobey their parents. The penalty was to be stoned. That's how church folk be. They saw you leave. And now you're trying to come back. And they got slick stuff to say. They got rocks to throw. And the father says, hold up, wait a minute. I saw his heart. See, that's when church folks say, I don't know why she up there trying to report. She ain't ready to repent. She just playing anyway. Skip you. Understand, God saw my heart. Even before I had to say a statement to you, who are you to qualify and quantify my repentance? It's God who sees the heart. So when the father saw his son coming, he said, look here, I'm going to start running. I'm running for my son, but I'm also running so everybody up in here knows that I got my child covered. If you're going to throw a stone at him, you got to throw a stone at me. So verse 22, as he's running to his son, and in verse 21, as he's running to his son, he gets to him, he hugs him, and he begins to kiss him in perfect tense over and over and over and over again. And I'm going to kiss him in front of all y'all. So y'all start acting fake as if God can't do. And the son says, hold on, wait a minute. Okay, you ran over here. You done hugged me. You're kissing me. Hold on, wait a minute. I got to tell you something. Father, father, father. I've sinned against heaven. I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy. Be called your child. I'm trying to apologize. And the father's saying, look here. You ain't got to speak. The love I have for you doesn't need your mouth. It needs your heart. So he says, look here. Shh. He turns to the servants. This son is coming back. Not to be a son, but to be a servant. When the father sees his son, he tells the servant, get this man everything he needs, not to become my servant, but to become my son. Quick. Bring the best robe. Better said, bring my robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger. Put sandals on his feet. Meaning what? 
the moment you come back to your father, I don't care how long you've been away, I don't care what you've been doing, the moment you come back, the father will say, put my robe on him, cover him. Put a ring on his finger, meaning what? Give him my power, give him my authority. And stop walking around barefoot. Slaves walk around barefoot. Put some sandals on him because in me he has freedom. He covered me. He gave me power, gave me authority, gave me freedom. And not just that, verse 23 and I'm done. Because I'm sure the community, i.e. the church folk, I'm sure the older brother, i.e. the self-righteous, was saying, hold on, wait a minute, hold on. I, I see what you're doing, but you can't do all that. He, he was out there wild and riotous living. What we going to do about this sin he got? Oh, yeah. Bring the fattened calf. Because for sin, something got to die. Kill it. Not any calf. The fattened calf. That means this calf most presumably was here when the boy left. And the father kept it waiting. Because I planned for your return even before your exit. I planned for your course and your recourse. Before God ever made me, he dispatched Christ to save me. Kill the fattened calf. Let's feast and let's celebrate. Let's be standing and not singing. Let's be standing and not singing. I ain't finished, but I'm through. <laughs> if perchance you are here on this afternoon and you are a child of God, but you've sinned, you've strayed, you've lived life beneath God's purpose for you. Perhaps you need prayer this morning. Prayer for peace, prayer for direction, prayer for protection. Will you come? I don't know how you do things, but this is how we're going to do it today. Will you come forward? Will you walk down these aisles? If you need prayer, will you come? If you need peace in your life, will you come? If you've sinned, will you come? If you're guilty, will you come? If you've been in a far country and you want to come home, will you come? If perchance you're not baptized, not a believer, not a member of the body of Christ, not made Jesus Christ your personal savior, I don't care if you're 11, 51, or 81, come to Jesus even on today. How do I come to Christ? You must first hear the word of God. You've heard me. I'm loud enough. Now here's the question. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? If you're 17, you have an answer. If you're 14, you have an answer. If you're 75, you have an answer. One question, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? The answer is yes, will you repent of your sins? The answer is yes, will you confess that he is? The answer is yes, will you be baptized in water for the mission of your sins? To receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's only one way to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and that's through water baptism. People say things in church that are cliche but are not truth. The Spirit fell on us at church today. Who dropped them? We caught the spirit. Who threw him? Come to Jesus by order of the Father and receive the spirit. Want to become a Christian? Walk down these aisles. Is that a good distance away? Need to rededicate your life? Walk down these aisles. You are too close to remain so far. The distance of this young man was great. To get back to his father's house, the distance right now for everybody under the sound of my voice is but a few steps. You want truth? You want a better life? You want a better way? Walk down these aisles. Will you come? Are you in sin? Will you come? Want restoration? Will you come? Want to be baptized? Will you come? This is the time. If you need to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, make today that day. Well, I'm nervous. Hold somebody's hand and walk with them. Because if you knew how sweet Jesus is, you walk on top of these pews to get to him. Life is too short. Eternity is too long. And hell is too hot. Somebody needs to be walking. Well, Jeremy, why are we standing? Because if your mind is made up, you can always just walk. Because the battle's already over.
Well, Jeremy, I'm waiting for the invitation song. If you got the message, you don't need the melody. Will you come? Want a new start? Will you come? Want the church to pray for you? Will you come? Want to be saved? Will you come? Are you the grandchild who's been ready to be baptized? Are you the grandfather who's been ready to be baptized? Are you the person who says Sunday after Sunday under Brother Miller, knowing what you must do? Because the things you know you are then responsible for. And everybody right now is responsible for their soul. The United Negro College Fund says a mind is a terrible thing to waste. Let me tell you something. A soul is a terrible thing to waste. Come now, right now, as we sing the song of invitation. I have won. He is more than able. Yes, yes. He is more than able.